All right. So hi, um, it's me again, Adelina. I'm a council member of HA Icon. So um, welcome to our Friday night talk and also the third talk of our Macau in um, Perspective series. So tonight we have um, Dr. Elisabella Laria Lam Lam Boxy. So um so um she is a Macanese scholar and um a Macanese herself, um, who is who is who has done a lot of research on um preserving the Macanese um, patois. And she is also a team member of the uh, patois play, which she will um kind of tell us all about on and also on the Macanese culture as well. So um let us welcome um Bella. Yes, hi. Hi, hi. I'm both in Macau. So <laughs> I, I have my Macau um nightscape <laughs> as a background, and um, um Bella has a um historic photo of Macau. So hi everyone. So, so yeah, you, you can start now, um Bella. Okay, thank you very much, uh Delina and um, thank you very much for the opportunity for me to share my passion, the Macanese culture, uh, in particular my uh, research on Batois theatre. So uh, I started my research in Macanese culture in 2004, so almost 20 years ago. But uh, there's still so much to learn. We often presume we know our uh, culture, but the more you dive in uh, into it, the more you know you need to learn it. So um, my research on Badois theater started in 2011, uh, but it took me some years to familiarize with Badois because I needed to have a certain level of comprehension before I could really analyze the video recordings. So in the early uh, video and performances of Badois theater, there were no translations nor subtitles. So I had to rely on the videos to transcribe the scripts and conduct the analysis. So before I start um, to uh, share what I've learned, I'd like to show a clip of one of the performance by Dossi Papia Sandi Macau in 1996. So that uh, for those that have never watched uh, Batua theater before might have an idea of what it used to look like. So uh, the name of this performance is Sayong Terra Galanti. Sayong is Portugal. Sayo. So, and Terra Galanti means a uh, strange land or a peculiar land. So, this recita was performed prior to the Hanover when uh, immigration to Portugal was the hottest topic among the Macanese. So, here I go. <laughs> if any of you were able to understand the language in the recita. But um, the first word we are learning in this sharing is recitas. Recitas is a word for patois theater short sketches. So the recita I just showed you was performed by Dossi Papiasan di Macau. The only theater group in Macau that performs patois theater every year since 1993. It is also the protection unit of um, Macau's uh, National Intangible Cultural Heritage, the National ICH. So the picture on the left is a captured image from their video recording. When we compared it, uh, compare it to the performance in 2015, you notice that um, uh, there's a sub subtitle screen um, 
I, I'm sorry. Uh, is I don't know if if that's um, there's a a sound uh, since I'm the host, Adelina. Yeah. Yes. Since I'm the host, there's always a, a sound. Uh, when when someone comes in. Yes. Uh, maybe oh. it's better if if it's taken off. <laughs> is it possible? Okay. Okay. Let me let me fix it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll, I'll do it on the back end. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Oh, Sorry for the interruption. So let me let me continue. So the picture on the left is a captured image from uh, their video recording. So when we compare it to the performance in uh, 2015, now uh, shown indicated with the red arrow, there is a subtitle to screen. So the actress says his or her lines, whereas the screen displays. Chinese, Portuguese, and English translations. So at first glance, we can also see that there are other differences between the previous recitish to the recent performances. The lighting is much more sophisticated and the stage designs are more complex, but there are actually more changes than meets the eye. So to understand the changes in Patois Theatre, I'd like to offer more background information first. The performance language of Patois theatre is Patois, a Creole language of the Macanese. As I have mentioned in the title, Patois theatre is a form of community theatre. So traditionally, it was performed only by the Macanese. So who are the Macanese? So here are some of the uh, photos of Macanese descendants. So uh, can you identify them merely by facial features? Let me give you a few seconds. I know, like I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know Miss Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, but, uh, I know. I know another is the the chef, right? Yes. Yes. The chef true, of true. Um, Americanist restaurant. Yes. And the guy on the top right is a singer. Yes. If I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. <laughs> and the one on the bottom left is a is it a po poet or a lawyer? Uh, um, it's a lawyer and lawyer. also an acclaimed uh, writer in Rika yeah. de Rika Nernish. Um, and actually these all are Macanese. So it's not really that easy if we uh, use only uh, facial features to distinguish uh, who is Macanese, who is not. So why is that? Because the Macanese community is composed with multi-ethnic and multicultural individuals. The definition of the Macanese identity has always been under debate. So how shall we categorize them? So as you can see, the facial features of the Macanese can vary across different biogeographic ancestry. So nevertheless, the Macanese are generally identified as cultural and biological hybrids with a tendency to having an element of Portuguese heredity. They are considered a mestizo descendant of Luso-Asian or Luso-African intermarriages that have their roots in Macau. So how did this community emerge in a Chinese territory? So to understand that, we need to have a bit of background information or knowledge to the history of Portuguese exploration. So I'll be talking a bit of history here, but uh, please let me state that I'm not a historian. And to be frank, it took me quite some years to really get a, a clear picture of the Portuguese explorations and the Macau's history, especially with the years, because uh, some registrations, books, or historians have different interpretations. The years may differ from one to a few years, but still it'd be helpful for us to really get a picture of, the, uh, of Portuguese exploration in order to understand the Macanese community. So the Portuguese exploration uh, the, and the empire grew uh, rapidly since the 15th century with the discovery and their settlement in places like uh, Cabo Verde, Cape Verde, Angola, Goa, Timor, uh, Macau, Ceylon, as we know it as uh, Sri Lanka and the Nagasaki route to Japan. So with the appointment of Viceroy of Portuguese India and also the building of fortresses in various places, the Portuguese were clearly settling in the East for good. So trading in this sense meant that there was a need for communication between the Portuguese and the native people. So we can pause for a moment uh, to look at the map 
and imagine the coming and going of merchants and mer missionaries in between these different ports. We should take note though, that uh, the King of Portugal actually prohibited women from boarding ships that were bound to the East. So aside from uh, the life-threatening risks during navigation, it was also a strategy to save uh, room for manpower. So Afonso de Albuquerque is the influential figure of early overseas Portuguese imperialism. He promoted the policy of rapidly populating the land and putting down roots. So in short, he encouraged intermarriages between the Portuguese and the native people. So the policy together with his uh, administrative measures were regarded as fundamental to the establishment of the Portuguese empire in the East. And obviously the eventual Portuguese based uh, Creole communities in different places. So um, these intermarriages created Creole communities in different Portuguese settlements. Uh, there had been some dispute of this uh, intermarriage policy. Afonso Abugagic encouraged them, but seeing that the uh, increase of miscegenation was rapid, the King of Portugal started to take measures to control it, such as sending female orphans to the King uh, uh, to India uh, to increase intermarriages amongst the Portuguese. But of course, this only had an effect to a limited extent. There were still a lot of intermarriages between uh, Portuguese and native people. So registration uh, shows that many women that accompanied the Portuguese in the ships were possibly their half-caste daughters, concubines, or female slaves from various uh, settlements, including Timorese, Muay Thai, or even Japanese women. So looking at this slide, um, you can see various identifiers of different ethnic and cultural origins of these women. So of course, the King of Portugal did forbid uh, Portuguese men to bring along women and slaves in the ships. Laws were implemented, but due to the distance, many of these laws were not always obeyed. So as we have a saying in Cantonese, San Go Wong Dai Yun, literally mountains are high and the emperor is far, far away. So and in this case, there are oceans apart. So the situation of families traveling along the sea route was pretty common. So now let us look again at the map and imagine the people traveling around. The maritime sea Silk Road uh, contributed to the increased cultural inter-exchange and also the migration of population, for example, from Mozambique to Goa, to Malacca, to Macau and Nagasaki. So now not dwelling too much in historical details, the conclusion is that many of these families eventually ended up in Macau because it offered a greater stability for, the, for them to settle in. So for instance, in 1641, Malacca was seized by the Dutch. So a lot of those uh, Portuguese-based Creole families ended up in other places, including Macau. Another example would be the Sagoku policy, the closed country policy imposed by the Tokugawa shogunate in Japan which resulted in the expulsion of Portuguese from the country. So again, these different social and political turmoils did increase the settling of Portuguese-based Creole communities in Macau. That's why we can see that there are different kinds of facial features of Macanese in the early years. So I hope that uh, with this, you might now understand a bit why the Macanese identity has always been difficult to define especially with its complex ethnic components. Now, for those interested, I would recommend reading The Genealogy by uh, Georges Fourjage, published in 1996. It is like a uh, chokpo. It has a total of three volumes and the name is Familiish Makengsish, so meaning Macanese families, with records of approximately 44,000 members of the Macanese community. So in this photo, I flipped to the page to the picture that included my grandfather and his siblings. So the red arrow points to my grandfather, who is also the groom of in this wedding picture. So these three books are actually very important for us um, because it was from this book that I came to realize I was, I belong to the eighth generation of Macanese in Macau. So, but still after all this, who are the Macanese? So 
are all Creole Mac, uh, are all Creole in Macau Macanese, or are all Eurasians in Macau considered as Macanese? Well, not exactly. For the Macanese community, locality is very important. The link is to Macau, the roots and our home. So known in Portuguese and as Macaense, in Batuá as Maquista, Macau Filo. And in Cantonese, we usually call ourselves a Tousang, a Tousang Zai, Tousang Mui. The older generation would, would identify as Mu Mun Zai, and other people would call us Tousang Tou So with this terminology, it's quite obvious that we, the Macanese, distinguish ourselves primarily according to our homeland. So in the late uh, 1960s, a uh, Macanese uh, band composed a song called Macau Terra Minha, meaning Macau, my homeland. So this actually also expressed that sentiment. I've quoted a uh, corner to aid our understanding of this concept, where the ethnic homeland is more than a territory. The ancestral land, like we say, Ha, or homeland is filled with emotional attachment. So the Macanese valued their usually uh, history and rights. I remember uh, during my research on Badoa Theatre, an interview we expressed her peculiar way to explain to newcomers or new immigrants of Macau how she is not a foreigner living here. She's not Ngoi Guang Yang, she's Ngo Mun Yang. So she explained via the idea of Bai Zhou Xin, paying the respect to the ancestors. Now here's a quote, quote from the interview. My Chinese colleagues asked me many times, what are you? I told them I was Macanese. I had to explain that we were here for over 300 years. And to make them understand better, I would explain that I pay respect to my ancestors in Macau because they were all buried here. Because the Chinese have the notion of going back to where their roots lie. That is where their ancestors were buried to pay respects. So it was my way of making them understand that I am from Macau. So during Tengming Ji or Tom Sweeping Day, many people would go back to their Hong Ha. But many of the Macanese need not leave Macau because their Hong Ha is here. This is their ancestral land. So Juan de Pina Cabral, a Portuguese anthropologist, conducted his research in Macau prior to the Hanover. And he used a few uh, criteria to classify the Macanese, including language, specifically any form of association with uh, Portuguese language, religion, in particular uh, Catholicism, and also Eurasian appearance. He also coined the term uh, traditional families here, where it indicates that they meet the above criteria. Of course, given they have a distinct affiliation to Macau and would present themselves as having their roots here. However, does it mean anyone that do not meet these criteria are not Macanese? So many might beg to differ to limiting the Macanese uh, identity to just a few vectors. Anyway, the definition of Macanese is a very, very, very complicated topic. Um, and um, I, I've joined a debate or a, a colloquium uh, organized by the Macanese Association. And a few of the panels were about the definition of the Macanese identity. And of course, in the end, no one arrived in one single definition. So I think I won't be able to bring out every aspect of the argument here, not even after 10 talk series, I think. So I'm sure those Macanese watching this now would understand what I'm talking about. So for the sake of um, easy understanding, uh, here are some reference points that I've picked for those that might uh, still be confused with the Macanese identity. Again, this is not an absolute definition, excluding all possible interpretation. So this is just an attempt to simplify a very complex idea. So first of all, usually the Macanese are multilingual. They would speak Cantonese, English, and Portuguese. Of course, some may vary in their fluency uh, on each language, but the majority would understand that. Of course, nowadays, this is a very a common situation, different ethnic groups, especially given to the, to the globalized communication. So there are, of course, other identifiers. So for instance, cultural practice. Now, most Macanese are Catholics, and it's visually possible to notice the home decoration of the Macanese, which might include cultural artifacts from Eastern and Western designs. And most 
uh, importantly, an altar in some of the homes. An altar is a table or a small place dedicated to honor God, like a santoi. So uh, you can see from the picture on the right, um, it's an example. So however, the mechanism is also believed, uh, also believes in uh, feng shui. So I know a number of mechanisms that uh, will go every year to si tai shui, to pai tai, pai tai shui, to pay the respect to the god deity presiding over the year. Uh, some would go to consult uh, feng shui masters or have their face or palm read by Chinese master tai sheng, tai zheng. So it's a mixture of Catholic religion with Chinese folk customs. So other cultural practices includes handicrafts, such as the Ping doll, I've shown uh, it in this slide. Uh, here it is also, I, I've brought it. <laughs> so this uh, Ping doll is actually a Macanese wedding doll. So in a traditional Macanese wedding, you'd see these dolls uh, handmade by family members and they will be placed and offered to guests. And another item you'd see is a slice of wedding cake shown in the picture beside uh, the wedding doll. So which brings me, this is a wedding cake wrapped, it's usually given uh, to each of the, of the guests during the wedding. So, and this cake brings me to the next identifier, food culture. So many of us, the Macanese, have followed the tradition of having a Christmas meal with traditional Macanese delicacies, as you can see in the picture, such as la casa, chao mai fan, ginette, Empada, Mingguai, Kushkuronj, and so on. So as you can see, um, this is part of the Macanese gastronomy. And Macanese gastronomy, together with Batua Theatre, have been enlisted as China's national ice age. So food culture here does not only indicate Macanese gastronomy. In many um, families, Macanese would also have both Portuguese and Chinese cuisine at home. So while well, I have Spanish blood, so, so I have one more. I have Spanish uh, cuisine as well. Well, Basque cuisine to be exact. So, but many like me would also have faced the experience of being asked, do you use forks and knives or chopsticks during meals at home? This is a very common question we have. But I'd say, well, depends on what I'm having. So if I'm having steamed fish or hot pot, I'll eat it with chopsticks. But if we are, we're having mean tea, then Western cutlery. So my grandfather, on the other hand, and some of the Macanese too, they only use Western cutlery. And even if we were having Chinese cuisine. So if I may say, um, Macanese hou yao hou fu, we have uh, gourmet luck. What is a cha lai. So it's very, very, uh, a very privileged thing for us. So, um, there are also a lot of identifiers for the Macanese identity, including identification of family origins, family surnames, which links to the traditional families uh, concept explained earlier, or acceptance of the community as being a member. But in the really early days, there's one more trait that distinguishes the Macanese from other ethnic groups. That is the language of the Macanese, Patua. So João Feliciano Marques Pereira, a historian who published one of the earliest analysis of the Macanese uh, Creole language in the late 19th century, around 1899, uh, compared Batua with Cristang and proposed that there were obvious influences but distinguished differences. So we talked about the Portuguese exploration and during this time, a pigeon was um, developed so a pigeon uh, with words from Portuguese and native languages was used to aid communication between Portuguese merchants or explorers with uh, the native people. So a pigeon develops into a Creole when the children of pigeon speakers acquire it as their native language. So as a result, rich uh, Batois-based Creole languages were created across the Atlantic Ocean and Indian Oceans. For instance, Cape Verdean Creole, Guinea Creole, and Cristang, a Creole language of Malacca. Batois is actually thought to be a Creole first borrow from Cristang. And archaic Batois shows resemblance to it. 
I participated in a um, Kristang festival held in Singapore in 2017, and I was able to communicate simple sentences, of course, uh, with the Kristang speakers, we were able to communicate. So, well, my dream is one day to hold a Makishta festival in Macau. So let's see if one day we can really do it. But anyway, the uh, resemblance and difference between Kristang and Batua is quite obvious. If I were to read uh, Kristang, I would have to pronounce it in my head first though, uh, before understanding it, because the written form is very different. As you can see from the example I gave here. So in Kristang is ki faze yokore, in Patois is ki fui faze yokore. So it sounds very similar, but when you read it, it's quite different. Um, so Patois obviously over time and eventually through many years was developed to a language with syntax and semantics of its own. So it was a means of communication in Macau, uh, especially for the Macanese for over 300 years. We can find words originating from Malay, Kokanin, Spanish, and of course, Cantonese. Here are two examples of Patois words with influence of other dominant languages. For instance, chupi means to pinch, and it comes from a Malay word. The Patois sentence, ki fui vus chupiyo, means why did you pinch me or why are you pinching me? Another illustration, which is my favorite, is amochai, which literally uh, means darling. It comes from the Portuguese word amor, means love, and zai from Cantonese, which is a word that denotes uh, small, or when you use it with names, it expresses affection, like no gong zai, right? So this word is a clear demonstration of the intercultural richness in Patois language. <clears throat> so in my research, I have proposed that Patois has now been transformed from a home language to a performance language. So here the performance language doesn't mean only on stage. What I mean is we use the language to perform our cultural identity. So Patois, also known as lingua antiga, uh, ancient or old time language, is actually no longer the conversational tool of the mechanism. So as you can see, UNESCO's last study uh, categorized it as a critically endangered language. Now we can look at the degrees of language endangerment on the, on the table on the right. And a critically endangered language indicates that the younger speakers are grandparents and older, and they only speak the language partially and infrequently. So and seen from this diagram, the next category is extinct. So in order to safeguard a critically endangered language, we have to do documentation, revival, and education. So let me grab this opportunity to talk a little bit more about this language. We have various names for Patois, Lingu Manquista, Lingu Nyonya, uh, Papia Cristan de Macau, Papia Sang. Uh, usually in Chinese, we call it Tou Sang Tou Yu. Some would call it Tou Sang Tou Yu. So Patois has a simpler and straightforward lexicon and phonetics when compared to Portuguese language. But however, it sees to be the main communication tool due to various reasons, such as education policy that implemented standard Portuguese education in schools starting early 20th century, migration, uh, increased intermarriages outside the Macanese community, mass media, people began to listen to English radios, uh, they watched Cantonese soap operas and etc. So I, I even remember my grandfather saying that they were fined in school if the teachers heard them speak Patois. So with all these, how did Patois survive until now? If I may boldly say so, it survived through Patois theater, especially because of Dosi Papia Sangdi Macau's persistence in presenting a play every year. So Dose Papia Sang di Macau, as I've said earlier, is the only theater group that presents uh, a performance every year. So my first experience with Patois theater was in the year 2000, more than 20 years ago. So I was an audience then. I went there because my mother suddenly told me I had to go. She, she, I remember the words, uh, her words were, you have to see this show. I will bring you every year to watch it because this is our language. You have to know where your roots lie and learn about your culture. 
So to be frank, in those days, I was young and I preferred to go to the cinemas with my friends. But then I, I went and because um, she told me one thing that, that really marked me was that because in the past she received Portuguese education and had to learn Portuguese language instead of speaking our own language, the Macanese language. So it was time, like she said, it was time to grab our cultures back and I needed to know where my roots lie. So I went and funny enough, I was able to understand some of the contents. I didn't know that there were actually phrases and words used at home that were patois. I thought, always thought it was Portuguese. So I had to, from time to time, ask her what they were saying, but nevertheless, I fell in love with it. So in 2007, I did a documentary film on the Macanese. If you are interested, you can try to locate it uh, in YouTube. It's called Fios de Terra. And it was then that I came to be acquainted with Dose Papier Sandy Macau because I went and shot some of their performances and behind the scenes moment. So I joined the backstage in 2008 and I have learned that like me, everyone was a volunteer there. It was like a big family. So in 2010, I started to look at, a, at Patois Theatre with a different perspective, more like an academic looking at it. I decided to, that I wanted to conduct a research on Patois Theatre because back then this, uh, the studies on this subject was scarce. There were studies about Patois language itself, but not much on Patois Theatre. So I was only able to find one article published in 1994 by Cecilia Georgia that provided background information and also the for, uh, how Dose Papessang de Macau formed in 1993. So interestingly enough, I started to watch the videos, but it was really difficult because the, there weren't any subtitles. So it took me some years to understand the language and to dig the information of this performance form. So I was able to find a published script on Patois theater performance presented in 1925. So which led to my assumption that the Patois theater has a history of over a hundred years. So the name of this performance was Gavatu Fang 74, meaning after the typhoon of 74. The story was set in the aftermath of an uh, infamous typhoon that took place in 1874. Some might have heard it, also known as Kap Sok Fong Joy. So that performance started with a scene uh, between a Malay servant and her employer, a Macanese housewife. The housewife began her scene with a criticism, criticizing the government's incompetence. And, and this paragraph alone already shows the social hierarchy at the time, as well as the community's discontent about the administration. So, the published brochure introduced the uh, performance as Operetta in Patois. So Operetta is a kind of light like opera that includes dialogues, songs, and dances. The Patois theater is also said to be inspired and derived from Teatro de Revista, Macanese theater, which was popular in uh, Portugal and Brazil in the late 19th century. So Patois theater is a comedy theater with satire. It was used as a tool to critique social events and customs. So fast forward a bit, I was able to find also published uh, scripts of performance dating back to the late 1960s and 70s. So the scripts were mostly written by Ade, José de Santos Ferreira, who is a very important figure in the preservation and standardization of the Tua language. So these photos shows some of the performances at the time where the Macanese, uh, some of the Macanese in there had high social status in Macau, some lawyers, some representatives, they would cross the social boundaries and restriction and perform in the language that was regarded back then as broken language. Now we need to understand that in those days, uh, standard language was looked up upon as a tool to better job opportunities and social ranks. So in those times, those who spoke Patois were actually considered as uneducated or even belonging to the lower class, lower social class mechanism. So the negative connotation to Patois actually acted as a catalyst to its uh, decline. Less and less people spoke that language. So how did Patois theater continue under all these uh, implications? 
So traditional Batua theater was performed during Macanese carnival celebrations. So in my analysis, uh, I use Bakhtin's four categories of carnivalistic sense of the world as a framework to look at the various functions and features of the Batua theater to understand why it was essential for the community. Now it brought people from different social status together. They, it allowed eccentric behavior, meaning they were able to mock officials. And also they can use a Creole dialect that was then a marker of low social status. And lastly, and also it also um, allowed what was separated to be put back together, meaning that Batois, uh, Batois language being uh, despised can be presented on stage over st a standardized Portuguese language. So lastly, um, all jokes or foolishness during the events would be forgiven. So traditional Batua theater, the residents were usually performed in Batua only. And each performance were short sketches ranging from five to 15 minutes. So the participants of the performance, as you can see in the photo, were exclusively Macanese and the storylines were satire. The characters, as you can see also, were made to look ridiculous and raise laughters. Uh, they were usually parodies of classic uh, literatures or films. When this was performed, if I'm not mistaken, it was in 1969, it was near the, the years where, where the Cleopatra by Elizabeth Taylor was played. So it was a parody of that, that movie. So there were also performance concerning about uh, family relations, neighborhood gossips, mainly everyday lives of the Macanese communities. So Patois Theatre functioned as a means of gathering the members together to exhibit and also strengthen their cultural traits and collective identity. It is used to reflect the way of seeing of the Macanese. So however, with the decrease and a rapid decrease of use of Patois in Macau, Patois theater eventually became dormant in the late 1970s. One of my uh, interview expressed that the last show he saw prior to the revival was in 1977. So Patois theater was dormant for more than a decade and it was on the wake of the change of sovereignty and after the joint declaration in 1987, that the Macanese community came to realize the need to preserve and protect their own culture and identity. So in 1992, a group of Macanese gathered together in an attempt to revive Patois Theatre. I mentioned Adé just now, right? So Adé at the time was very ill and the initial intent was for him to be the playwright, but he eventually passed away on March 1993. So at the time, he was then considered the last Batois writer. And his death served as an alarm to the Macanese community that if nothing urgent and concrete was done to preserve it, it would eventually die out. So they invited Enrique de Sena Fernandes, uh, which was identified just now in one of the photos, an acclaimed Macanese writer. He used to participate in Ades play. So, but as he was overloaded with work, he suggested his son, Miguel de Sena Fernandes, to serve as a playwright instead. So when Miguel entered the group, he was most probably the youngest. He was a kid there. So, and amongst the older generation of Macanese who still spoke the language. So he had to work hard to learn it, but at the same time, he was privileged to be able to hear this sweet language spoken fluently at the time by these senior members. So from 1993 until now, he led the group with persistence and determination, and is most probably now the person that wrote the most Patois scripts in history. So the first revival performance of Patois Theatre was in October 1993. The group, without an official name yet, performed their theatre piece at Ola Presidente, meaning let's go to see the president. Uh, the president here is the president of Portugal, which was amongst the audience of this performance. Now this time I have added subtitles to aid your understanding. So here's the clip. <laughs> Chào mừng các bạn đã đến với chúng tôi.
a custa pura da cura da curso, já falou para essa pena. Se não tem cédula, não pode. Já falou? Ele é só uma calpinha. Não pode. Pai e mãe tem nome português? Não pode. A vontade, a vontade, só uma português que nasce na chata. So personally, when I first watched this recording, I was very moved by this part because the Macanese has always been the buffer of two cultures. We were always the in-between community, neither Portuguese nor Chinese. So this clip actually expresses the question of Macanese identity, not only to the audience or to the president, but also to the community. So the group eventually was officially named Dose Papi Sang Di Macau after the performance. Uh, literally meaning the sweet language of Macau. And from then onwards, um, an early performance of Batua theater existed. And much thank and much gratitude to many participants at the time and now, we are still able to listen to this uh, sweet language. So however, if you go to a Batua theater show nowadays, you might see a major difference with traditional Batua theater that I have described just now. So in the first years of Dosek performance, uh, the group retained its form, traditional form, where uh, the recitals were performed as a few short comedy sketches. Uh, the performance language was only in Patois, well, with uh, rare occasions of Portuguese only in accordance to the uh, story needs, like when they traveled to Portugal, so there's a Portuguese, that's the case. But the Patois theatre we have now have actually evolved. So I found a number of uh, differences in my study, and I've chosen some to discuss here. For instance, the season of performance. In the past, it was during, it was part of the Macanese Carnival. Uh, while it is now part of the Macau Art Festival. The sketches are now one story drama ranging from 1.5 hours to 2.5 hours instead of a few sketches recitals. The stage designs, as you can see, are obviously more sophisticated. You can see on the picture uh, on the left, the Resta in 1995 has a backdrop with painted furnitures and a few chairs in front. So whereas the performance in 2015, the picture on the right, the stage design is sophisticated and lighting well thought, there is an increased expectation now for a more professional level theater performance by the group compared to the more amateur community theater you can see. So, however, during my interview with Miguel, he did express that he prioritized involving Macanies and local uh, professional volunteers than outsourcing or, or outsourcing the job. So the main aim here is to gather those that are passionate with Batois theatre, uh, with local cultures and involve them, providing an um, opportunity to strengthen the bond as well as our cultural identity. So another difference is also the development of a uh, creative industry in Macau. There are more Macanies now and locals uh, in different sectors, such as graphic design, filmmaking, and et cetera, which allows the elevation of production level of Batois theater. So the volunteers are actually professionals <laughs> in their real life. So of course, when the, when the show depends on community and volunteers, there are also challenges such as manpower and timing schedules. So the stage design for one will uh, have to adjust according to the manpower or volunteers available for backstage. Then the script writing also depended on the availability of the actors. So uh, Miguel actually expressed that he was like, um, uh, if he wants to uh, make a ham yu zheng yuk bang, and he doesn't have ham yu, he has to change the script to mu choi zheng yuk bang. So he has to change his script according to the uh, actors available. So another major 
difference is the venue in which Patua theater was performed. Uh, in the past, the recitation was performed in the Pedro Pinto theater, which seats 2,076 audience. But now it is performed in the grand auditorium of uh, Cultural Center of Macau, which seats over 1,000 audience. And very often it's uh, performed in three consecutive nights with full house. So this also shows that although the number of Patois speakers have decreased, the number of audience uh, interested in this have increased. So not only the Macanese are going to the shows, but also the people from different ethnic groups of Macau or even outside Macau are going to the show. So of course, with development of performance art and technology, we now have short films during a Patois theater performance. So aside from the video overtures that sets the atmosphere for the relative story in the play, short films with advertisements, parodies, music, videos, or comedy have become an essential part of the show. The theater performance is still the main protagonist here. It's the main kick. As the director of the short film, Sergio Perez puts it, the short film is the cherry on the kick. So these short films reaches out to younger audience as well as permits discourse that could be edited without constraints of live performances. And it reaches out to a larger audience because it, it, because it allows viewers to watch it without temporal or geographical limitation. You can watch it around the world as long as you have the internet and any time. So uh, I've concluded also that the Patois theater have changed from an exclusive to an inclusive nature. First of all, the participants are not limited to Macanese only, but multi-ethnic participants. In the performance of 1995, Chinese characters were played by Macanese, but in 2002, Chinese characters were played by Chinese actors. And in 2011, you can also see other ethnic groups joining, such as the acclaimed Filipina actress, Bei Pri. She also performed. So even the themes have expanded over the boundaries. In the past, it was sent, uh, in the past, although social issues were also central to the Batwa theater, they are more focused on those specifically of interest to the Macanese community, like the neighborhood gossips and so on. But now the themes are of interest to the Macau population as a whole, such as um, health affairs, legislative, election, gaming industries, housing, to just name a few. So the audience would expand because they are also, also interested in that. So now the audience are actually every year, they would expect to see uh, what, they are, what they will be talking about this year. So I mentioned from the beginning uh, that traditional Batois theater was performed solely in Batois. So I've studied uh, Batois theater plays from 19... Batois is still the main performance language, but uh, in order to increase the ethnic diversity of the audience and at the same time attract younger Macanese who don't really use that language to the shows, there has been an increase in Chinese and Portuguese lines during the show. So although at first there were criticism, there were much criticism among the community to this approach, they were afraid that it would lose the texture or taste of Batua theatre. But uh, it was proven now that it was vital to have this innovation approach to the continuation of the Batua theatre. So the once exclusive theater of the Macanese is now a Macau spectacle. It reflects the multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multilingual uh, history of Macau. So when I watched the plays chronologically, I was able to see the history of Macau, especially what the people were going through that year, including the main concern or major incidents. For instance, prior to the uh, Hanover, the themes revolve around the cultural identity crisis of the Macanese, including even the migration waves at the time to Portugal. So there were times when the locals were uh, um, also concerned with uh, their uh, continuation in Macau or, or the future. But then 
now after after the the Hanover, you can also also continue to see different types of uh, themes like overpopulation or the gaming industry boom, and these were all reflected each year in the yearly performance in the mechanism. So audience now, like I've said, when they go to see the Patois Theatre, would expect to see the social issues or latest topic reflected in the show. So now having been enlisted as a national ICH, Patois Theatre would also be able to present the Macau image. I'm sure many people of Macau remember the slogan by MGTO, Macau Government Tourism Office. Macau is the difference, the difference is Macau. So what is the difference of Macau to other Chinese cities? Well, of course, for one, the Creole community born in Macau together with its culture and language, and also the bond and intercultural exchanges amongst various ethnic communities here. So it is presented on stage that we mingle together. So in order to maintain this Macau spectacle, it's important for us to safeguard its continuity. So the performances of Dossi Papir Sangli Macau in recent years have increased its number of participants, thus raising the uh, awareness of Badoua theater for more people. So the more people are involved, they learn more about the culture and they also drag their friends, their families along. So you, the, the level of awareness also grows. So another safeguarding measure is the involvement of younger actors with the experienced one. Some at first were skeptic because these younger actors may not be able to have a perfect patois pronunciation in their early performances. But we must really remember that this language is no longer the daily language of the Macanese. So we should support and encourage and appreciate their effort for trying to do their part. So the young and the experienced holding hands and working the same aim would be the really the spirit of inheritance. So again, to safeguard a traditional art form, uh, sometimes we need to be innovative. So the incorporation of social, uh, for, of uh, short films, subtitles and uh, getting the challenge of a bigger auditorium were actually vital to the spreading and increase of awareness of Batwa theater. So of course, there's a balance between the traditional and the new, but we were, uh, if we were to continue with our culture or our ICH or any ICH within the ghetto, I would say there are risks one has to bear. So another personal recommendation I have is to start with children and do whatever you can to promote the language used for this Batwa theater form. So this picture is a captured image of one of the videos of Dose Papier Sangli Macau involving children singing a Batwa song. You can uh, find it in, uh, in YouTube. Just type Dose Papier Sangli Macau in YouTube and you'll have a lot of uh, videos to look at. So, uh, and then there are children's book uh, about Batwa by a Macanese couple also giving their effort of introducing Batwa language to children. Personally, I've also made some Batwa flashcard online since the spirit uh, and the language, uh, we need to bring that spirit from stage to our everyday life. So if you can try to practice it with your friends, I'm talking to Macanese, non macanese try to learn a few words. You've learned Amotai, so you can start calling your loved ones, Amujai now. So it, I think and another um, important thing is that we all can do our part. When I started to make these flashcards, I was really uh, a bit worried because I wasn't a Batwa fluent speaker. But then if every one of us gives a little part to help the group and also help the ICH to continue, there are more chances for it to, to be inherited by future generations. So safeguarding Batwa theatre starts with you. I mean it. So everyone, if you can be a participant, if you can't be an audience, try to show your interest in all kinds of, of cultural heritage. So now here is the last video I've chosen to play. It's an MV which uh, lives, leaves me emotional every time I listen to it. It's a production by uh, Dossi Papier Sang. 
the original video is quite uh, it's longer, but I've, I've cut it cut it short so that we can all because it, I I think it's uh, a bit over time. So so uh, I've cut it short so that you can view the video together. Now let's enjoy. Vozazinha sente vida que lora, cuida do mira. Em São Paulo com suporta aqui, abri pra um gamundo galante. Raça, raça mistura do umbigo, pegado dança. Cada canto um garriso. Demonstra como San Macau, unga terra de gente linda, Macau champurado. Macau champurado. Com laia laia de sabor Somente na Macau Vós tem isto um gasplendor Sai de Cresa, vai pagode Sandi pivete, vai comunga Budista cristã, moro chuchunta do reza Cada canto um gamão, cada cor su coração, um gaterna de gente linda. Não sei o que é, 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 não sei o que Hey! Hey! Uh, uh, hey! So I hope you enjoyed today's sharing. I just posted the links on the on the chat box also. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm a follower of like all these. <laughs> So, oh, that's good. That's thank good. Thank you, Bella, for like an excellent presentation of um, mechanist culture and the language and like identifier and like what like what is considered mech mechanist. Because I um, I'm a Macau local and but I'm I'm Chinese Chinese right. I I can't call myself mechanist. I know that. So um, 
um, um, I'm truly moved that like um, your talk like brought to light like that's something I don't even know about I say Macau local. So mm -hmm. I grew up here, but I I moved I I I moved to the states in 1999. But like I think before the handover, there was not like I I had like Macanese friends. Mm -hmm. I have like sort of like Macanese sort of family friends, but I like never like my patois came into service like in my life at all. I can't re I couldn't remember anything about patois. Mm -hmm. So um, and I only kind of like um. Well, I was exposed to it because of um, you know, like one of the the old lady, I I either the Jesu, uh, Jesus, mm -hmm. like yeah. so she ran a restaurant and I would go there <laughs> to have a uh, mechanist meal. So mm -hmm. like like Bella said, like the mechanist gastronomy, the mechanist restaurants, like they are all kind of like the core mm -hmm. element in the mechanist community. Where sort of like kind of Chinese, the Chinese community kind of mm -hmm. Chinese people like me could also kind of um kind of be part of like through kind of the meal, the food, and also now it, now the theater. So I only got to know about Patois. I think like like in 2000, 2012, I think when I came back to Macau. Mm. So it was I like really late, like, so like, what did it ever, like, did it ever exist? <laughs> like, I, like, I couldn't like, believe that I never got exposed to it when I was like growing up in Macau. So thank you, Bella. And My pleasure. I think, like, Thank you, I enjoy. Yeah, they, like excellent presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, I think, <laughs> I think, I think like there are some mechanics like our oh, Macau locals here as well. So um, I think we can open for questions and yeah. Um, if I'll start first actually. So um, as the as sort of it was a like um endangered was considered endangered mm -hmm. language by UNESCO in two thousand twelve or two thousand five. Um, actually, the date, you know, I captured a few uh, photos. Sometimes it says 2000, sometimes 2005, sometimes 2007. But uh, the one I captured was in 2000, and it was uh, stated that uh, there had only been uh, 50 right. yes. around the world, the whole world, <laughs> not just Macau, 50 around the world. So. You are one of them, right? I can't. No, no, no. I, I, I can't. I can't. I can't assume that. I think I'm a patois enthusiast, but uh, I'm enthusiastic of, of the language. But really, to be a fluent speaker, you really need to practice and use it every day. So I know the language, but it's different with but uh, fluent speaker. Yeah. Standard. Oh, so how many fluent speakers left? Like that is my first question. So like maybe ten now. Now. We have to oh, well. Right. First of all, so I think I think we might need to think um, what how to define fluent speakers. You know, yeah. so um, and I, there are still a few fluent speakers. I may say there are a few fluent speakers, but um, the problem is now. Uh, I think the number of speakers is growing again. Mm -hmm. In my concern, because I've known some people, uh, young young people that are very interested in patois they are using the social media platform to check in patois mm -hmm. some uh, some aren't even mechanics and they are learning the language and they can chat really fluently but of course that fluency depends on the topic because we also have to understand that uh, patois language is an old language antique language and it used to be the language of the ladies as we say because the uh, the men start with the with the history that I explained, like the grandmothers of the Macanese, and then the men um, started uh, to pursue education. So they spoke more Portuguese. They had social status, and we also need to uh, bear in mind that in those times, women did didn't really pursue education. I'm talking about many years ago. So it was known as the women's language. So. Um, so actually, now people are more interested and appreciative of the Creole language. Like when you say maybe when we were small, it was not as common as to listen to this. Well, when I was small, you are still very, very young. But when, I was, when I was when I was really a, a small child, a kid, I, we, um, it wasn't that common to really hear that language. I mean, I do listen to a few. I heard a few. Uh, uh, phrases or words, but a conversation, it was quite rare. Um, also, it depends on the family. Like for, for example, my grandfather, 
he didn't speak patwa but his mother only spoke patwa yeah. so because uh, um, in those times the parents they want their children to learn the standard portuguese because when you speak patwa the um the pronunciation is quite different for example uh patwa corazon means heart some corazon mm -hmm. but in uh Portuguese is coração, so there is a different uh, uh, pronunciation, and also uh, patua is very in grammar wise, it's quite simple. So all the tenses sound the same. We use the same same thing, but Portuguese it's different. It's very complicated. It's a very complicated language. So to not um, um, to not affect that many families they prohibited their children to listen to talk this language they have heard it from grandmothers from aunties but they don't speak it when you don't speak the language it's difficult to really use it and pronounce it well now and also we also need to put into consideration in the past the people didn't look uh, they didn't appreciate dialects or Creole language. They appreciate the standard language. Now we know we appreciate it because we know there are a lot of uh, value in it. So now people are trying to revive it so that because it's like I, I said, it's not a sh uh, the Patois theater is just shallows of the Patois language, and the Patois language is a shallows of our challenge of our Manganese culture. Mm -hmm. So now we, it, I think it's similar to the to the sense that, for example, Cantonese language. When we speak Cantonese language and Putonghua, it's different. You have different cultural background. So the situation of Patua speakers, I think we have more people that are concerned and are interested in learning that language than before. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, I Google. Yeah. I Google like if I could learn Patua. And um, I found out University of like, St. Joseph offer a course, right? Yes. yes and yes. the prerequisite is I like one must know Portuguese to begin with. And, yes. <laughs> and that's a sort of like one prerequisite that like I think that sort of like um not like push people that could push people back, but like mm. since you you took up Portuguese, right? Quite well, I, I studied in an English school. Actually, yeah. my, my written Portuguese is not that fantastic to to be honest um because portuguese language again it's quite complicated so, but um i think um one of the um i think why they they really had that uh, as one of the requirements is that because it's like um uh, i think it's like if you teach cantonese to a putonghua speaker and teaching cantonese to an um, I don't know, a Portuguese that don't speak Cantonese <laughs> yeah. and don't know the language, it's different. So the pace is different. So if you have the Portuguese pace, it's faster. You yeah. learn faster, you understand the changes with them. And I, I remember I took that course as well. I went to learn, oh, wow. uh, always learn, always learn no matter what. I went and, and took it and it's only eight sessions. So with eight okay. sessions, I, I remember it's only eight classes the first uh, yeah so with eight sessions we were able to uh, really write sentences in patwa language but it's because we have the base we have yeah. portuguese language as the base that's why really to understand Macanese culture if you have at least a bit of comprehension i don't mean we have to be a fluent speaker mm -hmm. nor a right portuguese literature but at least if you have some knowledge of portuguese you'd be able to understand a bit more about the Macanese culture as well as the Patois language. Yeah. Yeah. I'll work on that, Bella. I'll work on my Portuguese first and I'll... <laughs> I'll <take laughs> Forza. 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 I know. That is the only one Portuguese or Macanese word yeah. I could understand. So any more questions from the, from the floor? I think it might be really sort of like strange for like I I I think for the like Hong Kong people. Mm -hmm. This is sort of really niche. <laughs> so <I> think, <laughs> right? Okay, question for Bella. You can read, right? From the chat. Okay, yes, yes. yes I'm not I'm not gonna read to read. Everybody, everybody can 
friend football shop at Park Bridge office is done. Oh, shop is done. I don't know to use the friends with her. So I'm using social media because of my question is that what oh, other ways I do think you maybe I should use I should read oh. it because it's recorded. Okay. So oh, okay. the for Bella is that the theatre is doing a good job in preserving and promoting Patois. Much of this is done in a comical way through performances and videos. I also noticed you just mentioned about some using social media to practice Patois. My question is, what other ways do you think people can preserve and promote Patois? Um, thinking about podcasts, yes, podcasts. Um, and you are doing phrase cards, but want to hear what other ideas you have or maybe other participants can also share. Well, uh, regarding the podcast, actually, uh, Miguel Vicente Fernandez, he, he did, uh, um, um, I think once a week, start he started a year ago, or I, I don't remember exactly the date, once a week uh, through the TDM radio, Portuguese oh, radio, yes. he has a, yeah, you know, a, a yes, short heard, program yes. that uh, introduces uh, Batois. And podcast wise, he's already uh, planning to do it. We've already discussed on this because uh, with podcasts, we can reach more. So other other, I would, for example, for me, I think it would be, be great if we could do a workshop, mm -hmm. like a workshop for all uh, four sessions um, with children or adolescents, because the problem is that uh, not everyone really, uh, 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 they would accept the challenge of going on a theater stage. <laughs> Some people are more shy, but uh, if we have workshops like uh, four or five session, where we uh, have a short script, for example, a script of five minutes or 10 minutes. And with memorizing the lines, uh, children or adolescents or even, even adults, through the workshop, they can memorize lines and understand the language and also understand the culture. So I think if we were able to organize such kind of workshops, it would be a great way even for people that are not, that might not be interested in joining the theater because not everyone are available for that but they can choose through also a patois theater but workshop and practice it so this is one of the way and another way i think would be great would be like i, I mentioned just now the makista festival if we were able one day to do a makista festival inviting different people I mean, if in a different environment, like, like you said before, uh, although you have Macanese friends, you might not really understand the culture. So with a festival, people would enjoy and also appreciate the culture. I mean, in the festival, we can have like stalls with patois, you know, works. People can learn from the words. They can have gastronomy or just like I said, the handicraft wedding dolls. If we had stalls where people with uh, practice or make the wedding dolls. There are a lot of things that we can, we can do to uh, preserve it. And I think uh, the important is really to promote as much as we can, because sometimes uh, there, there are people that I've heard that they, they think that why, why, why so little people know about Macanese culture? I think the problem is there are not many people coming out to talk about Macanese culture. So we need to push people like, like Dino, uh, people like Dino can come out and talk about Macanese culture so that we have, can listen to more, more different uh, aspects. Well, that's my answer. <laughs> and also as Solo and Macau local, I would invite you guys to talk about um, your culture as well. Because I, I think like um, what the beauty of the, the Macanese culture is, it has been uh, so deeply rooted in Macau that mm -hmm. you cannot find it any place else. True. The true. other place, yes. And this side, like um, in the video that you just show, kind of the ending video, you could yeah. see how kind of the, the multiculturalness mm. of Macau and also sort of like the scenery mm -hmm. and how people coming together and the skit, the comical way that like Dino yeah. was saying. So this is all kind of like quintessential kind of like, I think, characters of Macau. Mm -hmm. That is a like well captured in the, in the video. Thing. Yes, so you guys yes. can all have a look and um also in the same chat on the same channel kind of the the dosi papa okay so um so um 
in in that channel in the YouTube on the YouTube channel there are like a lot more videos that you can watch kind of like um like what Bella said like really short videos but not the full performance but like um really encapsulates the the nature of the play kind of the the kind of the um current affairs and gossip yeah, and sort of yeah. aunties chatting so, exactly so, it's like two two <laughs> and and um they uh, uh so in the last on the last performance in May that I attended they also did a skit on um kind of on the on the slab mm. the Oscar the Oscar slab <laughs> that you <laughs> can you can like you can find Bella in 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 that video mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes <laughs> <laughs> so um any more questions I I have uh, I'm just thinking apart from smoke um like do you know I'm I'm just thinking apart from um, spoken in families from one generation to another, how other things, how, how things like Hakka can be promoted and preserve any thoughts on this? Hmm. Mm, I, I don't really understand what you mean by how things like Hakka can be promoted. Hakka, and what is Hakka? Hakka, Hakka right? Hakka. Yeah, oh, Hakka. Hakka, right? Are you part Hakka? Yeah, Hakka, Hakka language. language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, let's like, see, like from my perspective, as sort mm. of like, my grandparents um, came from um, uh, Canton, mm -hmm. like uh, I think like uh, around wartime. So mm. basically like you guys, are, like you are the eighth generation or your, your grandfather was the me, me. <laughs> you are the eighth generation. Yeah, I'm so, the like, I think you, like you have been in Macau more, more like for longer time than like my family has. <laughs> That's what I found like wonderful. <laughs> so, like what we claim sort of like mm -hmm. sort of like um my cow is predominantly Chinese. And mm -hmm. but you guys have been here like like forever. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> like forever. I like well, that. <laughs> like, like hundreds of years. So um I think I can answer a bit of like kind of like Dino's questions. So, okay. so, like my grandparents would speak um kind of both sides, maternal and paternal mm -hmm. grandparents would mm -hmm. also speak kind of like her how like their dialects yeah but like like say i think like we face the same um kind of um threats that like mm. if you want to preserve haka mm. is there any way preserving themselves but that's my question oh you, mm. we, yeah let, let me answer um kind of kind of your question so mm. we like not even my mom and my dad's kind of um generation were were encouraged to, to speak in the mm. dialect so it kind of naturally just died down and i and i could not understand one word from mm -hmm. kind of the like Canton mm -hmm. dialects. There's not really strong like Hakka, but like kind yeah. of they, they have like a unique way of like phrasing and kind of their vocabularies are, are different. I could understand, but I could not kind of say it like mm -hmm. how like my grandparents would do. Well, um preserve well, I, it to answer yeah. uh, and to I know many may speak Hakka as a mother language. So, is there any other ways of preserving this outside of family? That's well, frankly, to 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 be frank, uh, to preserve a language, you need to use it. Yeah, that's the basic. That's the basic. You don't if you don't speak it in in family. I mean, out, if you want to do it outside family, you do it with friends first. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are steps to do it, right? If if you don't do uh oh. And yes, if you really don't don't uh, start from within, how do you spread outside? That's that's what I think. You need to start from within to sp spread to outside. And also, I think workshops or lessons do really affect because uh, when I went to the lesson uh, to the Batwa classes, uh, actually it wasn't really just um, Macris. There were Chinese interested in, in that, and they learned. I remember. Even uh, I've re received an email from Shenzhen uh, asking me about Patua theater, uh, about Patua language, because I made those flashcards mm -hmm. and she found those flashcards and she was arranging. Uh, she was trying to, because with the flashcards, there are a, a sentences example, and she was arranging uh, um, sort of uh, how to write the grammatical rules and so on. Mm. And, and there are plans, we are having plans to also maybe make a Patois workbook. So with Patois workbook, we would be able to extend further outside family. And even families can use it to aid and teach their children and those interested. But the problem is many of the people usually when they are interested, they are usually uh, in the linguistic field. Most mm. people are in the linguistic field. So we have to extend further. So uh, I think with uh, various methods, 
we can in, eventually um, uh, increase the interest in learning the language. And also I think it's not just the language, it's the culture as well. One has to be interested in the culture to be interested in the language. So like I, I saw a kid, uh, Kit Wu, she said that uh, it's, it's just workshops or plays to secondary students. Actually, I joined one um, workshop just a few months ago. It was in a secondary school. So I, I went to the workshop. It was a 15 minutes seminar slash workshop. And so uh, we rapidly introduced the Macanese culture and the children were interested with the flashcards. Even I remember one children, I was walking around and he came to me and he said, how to pronounce Amotai? <laughs> yes, I said, yes, yes. You, you see the children are actually also very interested in that. Um, so I think it's important also because I, I know there are um, even theater workshops in secondary schools, but the problem also comes back to volunteers because many of the Macanese uh, Batois theater actors are actually volunteers. They have their own full-time jobs. So there are differences and challenges, but I think where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> yeah, I see another. Yeah, it's a long question. Should I read it? Thanks, Bella, um, sharing with us your journey to the sweet language. Conserving the language, it, it is not only about the language itself, but also conserving the culture and the spirit of the community that the um, language conveys. Do you have um, do you have a systematic do you have systematic programs for, for re revitalization of the language in addition to theater, such as making use of medium of mainstream subculture and subcu subculture via um, music, songs, multimedia? Do you have funding for works like that? Well, um, the show at the Dossi Papier in Macau, because it's part of uh, Macau Arts Festival, it has funding, but mm -hmm. it's only the funding for that show. Oh. Um, concerning the funding, I would I would prefer Miguel de Sinovanish to answer it because he knows better. I really don't don't really know that part, but um, I think to be honest, if we were to do it in the long run, we really really need to uh, think about the funding as well. It's it's just yeah. I mean we are we we are obviously not doing this for money. But uh, the problem is, is without funding, if you really want to have a proper, like I said, the Makishta festival, if you want to really yeah. have a festival, how do you do it? I mean, although we are, many of, of us are willing to give, give out and, 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 and to offer, but then it's not the long run. Um, but with the songs and actually music, there are, for example, um, we, we have Delf Delfino, Delfino Gabriel, who is now uh, also, um, he, he's a Macanese, he's making a lot of uh, uh, Patois songs. He's not, not of the group, but he's an in, uh, individual musician and he, he sings in Patois. Um, so actually it's also like, like what I mentioned earlier, everyone has to have an effort. Of course, if we have a group of people and that's, that's an ongoing thing that we are, we are now organizing. A group of people working together, it's always systematic and better with, uh, but it takes plan and takes, takes times, except, especially with all this COVID situation. I've seen a lot of friends with uh, theater or workshops or things, they have to be suspended and, and so on. And it's challenging, but I think again, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Well, we can like thank Bella for an That's excellent. Cool. <laughs> excellent. Thanks for the wonderful fruitful sharing. Yay! Yay um, great. Sandra <laughs> Loka, thank you so much for a wonderful. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Um, thoroughly enjoy myself. I speak. Oh, I speak Portuguese now, and I might consider. Oh, Cassandra. Yeah, Loka. please do. Please do. Please it's do. easier, so you can really <laughs> learn. I'm, I'm learning, I'm just learning Portuguese on Duolingo, so I'm, it might take me longer. No, actually, Patois is easier, trust me. Patois oh is easier. God. So you, you can like, think Actually, Bella and I went to the same school, but like different years. So we had to learn, right? We had to, we like yeah. in the colonial era, we had to learn Portuguese. Yes, so yeah. I, I had some background, but like, I think it was like so many years ago that I could not pick up anymore. <laughs> I used to be really good though. 
<laughs> okay, so um, uh, yeah, so I will pick up. I'll join you, Cassandra, but you go ahead first, or you you contact Bella if you have feel, any. Feel free, feel free to contact me. Offer any help? Uh, I'm what Chai? Oh, thank you, Bella. I'm what Chai. Oh, thank is you, there, thank you, I'm what Chai. Thank you, all the I'm Chai's here. <laughs> I'm okay. You say like, um, is is is, is that kind of a uh, feminine or a uh, muscular or just amochai for everyone? Just amochai, just amochai. Oh yeah, so of course we easy, also but... some people will call amonoi. Amonoi is fem feminine, right? Feminine, but amochai. Uh, mostly we call amochai. Okay, we so we learn one wrong. at least that yes. we can like apply daily. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> amochai and force amochai. Yeah. Because that is like uh, add oil, right? It's like kind of guy. Yes, right? yes, add oil, exactly. Because okay. I see the ad on like kind of like on the bus every day, like Fossa, uh, Genti yeah. di Macau, like Macau. Uh, <laughs> you see yeah, that? Genti di Macau. Eh. So I learned Foss, I learned about Fossa. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, um, Bella and everyone. Thank you, everyone. Nice thank weekend, you for your all you know. So um, thanks to Bella, this recording will be uploaded on YouTube. So, like, so you can like, feel free to share with your friends who are interested in Patois or like who are not interested but might be interested. Okay, so push can, it out. <laughs> push yeah, it spread out. the words. Like, this is my the, this word. is the intention of like how why, why I wanted to invite Bella to like this Thank talk. Because, like, I myself wanted to learn about Patois <laughs> as a non-speaker. Okay, so happy Friday, everyone. And happy, um, Friday, happy weekend. Join, join us um, next week on Thursday on like uh, Vicky Chan's talk on like kind of like more about ICH, like, how um kind of ICH could um be uh, instrumental in the co-creation between the tourists and the local. So I think this is, uh, is also relevant in terms of like this talk, like Bella's talk, and also last talk, like um the dragon, the drunken dragon festival. So it's all about participation and getting together and enjoying the moment and speaking the language so yeah, sure. do whatever we can okay exactly uh, yeah. so thank you <laughs> thank everyone. you thank you for the opportunity good thank night. you all. how to say good night in patois bonoiti bonoiti it's kind of like it's kind yeah, of it's like kind, kind. it's like uh, in portuguese it's boa noite We're so not, we okay. say boa noite but not so it's easier i told you it's easier to learn but but yeah. i can't even say doshi Papa, papa, some, papa, Dosi papia, papia, some. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the instruction. <laughs> Thank you, so, my boy. Noiti, everyone. Um, see you guys next week. Okay. You'll be. It will be the last talk. Okay. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Obrigada. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.